Good afternoon and welcome to LLT 180 Hero and Quest. Um, we're still awash in the wonderful and cheerful adventures of the Sumerian hero Gilgamesh. Um, today is not going to be particularly jolly as those of you who have actually done the reading will already know. But first of all, I want to take I want to take this opportunity to ask what kind of questions do you have about we co what we covered last time? I myself think that um, our discussion last time, what we talked about last time, was completely brilliant, made sense all by itself. But you're the ones who are going to be taking a test on this. Got any questions for me? Because I can lecture more. Taylor? About, are we going to go over the subject of the portal test? Pardon? Um, we can go over the study guide as much as you want, whenever you want, okay? Um, because I have learned that as annoying as these, why is your face the face of somebody who has traveled a long distance? Well, my face is the face of somebody who has traveled a long distance because I have, in fact, traveled a long distance. Well, then, since your face is the face <laughs> a long distance, I think, you know, I'll repeat something as many times as I need to to make sure you folks get it down. So if you have any specific questions, what the heck, hit me with your best shot while you're away. Why is there a Michelle Alexander Trojan Oh, Lord, somebody who notices these things. There is a McDonald's arch on the Trojan horse because these are tough times for higher education in the state of Missouri. <laughs> At this time... Our governor, Jeremiah F. <laughs> J. Nixon, has um, decreed that there should be a 12.5% budget cut to all Missouri quote-unquote state universities. Actually, at 53% support, this university should be called Missouri Half State University or U Missouri Mostly University. The problem is, is that their 53% ownership stake gives them the right to tell us what to do about everything. See under antiquities major, which we had up until last year. Um, but I thought, you know, in an attempt to make this class pay for itself a little bit better, I've been selling corporate placements for the junk that I draw on the board. <laughs> And I don't know, maybe I'll get an extra happy meal by the end of the semester if I can, you know, draw the golden arches on the Trojan horse over there. Good question. Brilliantly answered by me. Yes, question. Other questions? Yeah, go ahead. So I'm looking through the story, blah, 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 blah. And it's like Gilgamesh knows that he can't become immortal, right? Right. But he does, but he said that Enkidu dies, so wouldn't it be worse if he somehow did become immortal when his, he's going to have to live that much longer? Like, crap, my friend's dead, but I'm immortal, so I'm going to forever remember this instead of dying. Well, you bring up, you surface a really good point, Devi, speaking as um, a widower who has been a widower for one year and um, 12 days, not that I'm counting. It sucks. Um, and in many ways, it is worse to survive. I'm not going to compare notes. It's awful. Um, but at the same time, it gives you an obligation to live. And um, I don't know if I would want to live forever. I remember seeing a video of a crap song by Queen. <laughs> It was a crap song, but in my youth, you know, it was like 1992 or something like that. It was called Who Wants to Live Forever. Queen made so many great songs. This was a crap song. But it was basically just tore my heart out because Freddie Mercury, the singer of Queen, you know, was in the final stages of um, AIDS. And he knew he was going to die. He was looking back on his life and thinking, man, I had a blast. I was Freddie effing Mercury for all these years. <laughs> But this whole carpe diem thing, this whole notion that um, seize the day, you know, it's all really good. When I was teaching, I was teaching this text 25 years ago, death is the salt that lends variety to life. If you were going to live forever, how many of you have ever read the vampire books of Anne Rice or anything like that? I think they're really awesome. These vampires, they live forever and ever and ever, and they get bored. <laughs> Just eternal boredom. Like... 
Well, better go out and bite something. <laughs> I don't have any answer. I really don't have any answer to why. It's a good question. But we're going to see poor Gilgamesh chasing around very agitatedly, knowing in his heart of hearts that nothing can bring Enkidu back. Um, nothing is going to guarantee him anything better than that depressing dream Enkidu gets stuck seeing when he's dying. That's a nice touch. But he has to do something. He has to keep moving. That was an excellent question. I hope I answered it okay. Um, any other questions? Any recap? Let's do a quick recap. Bethany, do you have one? You sure? Okay, because I can always lecture more. Okay, to recap where we've been with the Gilgamesh epic, Gilgamesh is lording it over the city of Uruk at the beginning of the poem. He um, is ruling over like a wild bull, which is not consistent with the public affairs theme of ethical leadership. Since the people of Uruk really don't really have a public affairs mission at the time, um, they're not really expecting very much, but when it gets so bad that Gilgamesh is demanding to do things like sleep with the bride first at every wedding party, they eventually cry out to the gods, Oh, great gods, please create somebody who will knock this Gilgamesh character down a peg or two. And in return, the um, Sumerian gods create this creature named Enkidu. Enkidu is Gilgamesh's alter ego. They're both big, brawny. Um, Gilgamesh will turn out to be a little bit stronger and mightier. Gilgamesh is also a king. Um, where they differ is that Enkidu starts out as a complete and total wild man. He doesn't even know he is a human being with human potentialities. He runs around chasing down animals and eating them raw, much like my dog, Yongi who I find out from my dog sitter, and he's only this big. He's a little bitty terrier dog with a white curly tail. And the first time I ever saw him, man, that's the stupidest tail I've ever seen on a dog in my life. And my wife said we should keep him. And I'm thinking, oh, really? He jumped up in the air and ate a robin. I said to Amanda, did he really jump up? She said, I saw him jump up in the air and eat a robin. <laughs> How the hell did I get there? Well, he enjoys life, okay? There, that's it. He's completely wild. Enkidu does that same sort of stuff, too. Um, just like in all sorts of bad movies, bad westerns, hero movies, you know the bad guy and the good guy are going to come together at the end of the movie or the story and there's going to be a showdown and the good guy is going to win. We can see the Gilgamesh versus Enkidu alter ego story ending in the same way. But first we have to level out the playing field. Through the agency of the so-called harlot, the whore, the prostitute, the Cartesian Shamhat, and the trapper, Enkidu becomes human. He becomes human through sex. He becomes human by being introduced to food and drink. Um, you all noticed last time they had sex for seven straight days. They didn't have any Gatorade, but um, the woman said, Enkidu, eat bread. It is the staff of life. Drink the wine. It is the custom of the land. So he ate until he was full, and he drank strong wine, seven goblets. He became merry. His heart exulted, and his face shone. He rubbed down the matted hair of his body and anointed himself with oil. Enkidu had become a man. And when he had become, put on man's clothing, he appeared like a bridegroom. And after a while, Enkidu starts behaving like a human being. He hires himself out as a guardian to the local shepherds, killing monsters and nasties. You know, that's civic engagement. Um, that's cultural competence. You know, he knows how to have sex and eat food and drink wine and stuff like that and wear clothes. He's making some grand steps there. But interestingly, I think 
um, get, he needs to acquire cultural competence, and he does. He's here so far to teach Gilgamesh a lesson in ethical leadership. When word reaches Enkidu that Gilgamesh is again demanding to be able to sleep with the bride at the wedding party, he says, I'm the new hoarder here. I'm going to take this biatch down. And um, the scene said they have a big wrestling match. Gilgamesh picks up Enkidu, throws him on the ground, splat, Gilgamesh wins. They become best friends forever. They go on an adventure to take on the monster Humbaba in the cedar forest. And really, this whole episode of Humbaba and the cedar forest really bores the heck out of me personally. I don't know, did anybody actually kind of find it mildly interesting? You would, Sam. Why did you find it interesting? I just thought it was interesting how at the end, like, he's fairly, fairly... Well, good point. I mean, there is some interestingly insensitive interplay between the characters. Um, but to me, it's kind of like that part of... Do they still make Rambo movies? What kind of action shoot 'em up movies do you kids have? I would just feel terrible making a reference to a Rambo movie, and nobody knows what the heck a Rambo movie is in 2012. And when they're playing this in another century or something like that, they're going to stuff me and put me in the corner of a building and project these lectures through my eyes. <laughs> um, what's a movie where you shoot people just shoot people up all the time? Okay, very good, you know, and they always have to find new and exciting ways and new and exciting guns and ways of killing each other and shooting. Oh, that is so 2006. He just blows up. You know, the gore is so fake. This is the best production values that the ancient Sumerians could come up with. So, basically, they cross the border into the, into the forest they go through the gate. I'm going to draw a gate. It'll have a big H for what on it? What does the letter H stand for in the gate to the cedar forest, kids? Thank you. <laughs> okay. And when he opens the door and walks into the gate with um, Gilgamesh, what is this called? Dynamic. Dynamic. What is your name? Jackson. Okay, and you're, no, where's Jack? Jack is not here. That's not good. Liminal experience. Okay, who asked that question? Okay, your name is Ryan. Or is it Raquel today? No, it's Ryan every day. It's Ryan every day, Ryan. Excellent, I'll be happy to. A liminal experience is like, well, you were here for my story about going to New Orleans yesterday, weren't you, Ryan, last time? Yes, no? Yes. Visiting the amazing dope-smoking woman. And um, I walked through the door with what turned out to be a gay bar. It was kind of like a liminal experience because if I started running out, I would attract notice. Once you cross a liminal experience, um, once you walk onto the campus of Missouri State University for the first time, once you walk out of the door of a church with your new spouse, you have crossed a threshold into what is effectively a new life. And usually in <laughs> stories, the um, liminal experience will be something pretty fancy. This one, Ryan, I agree, is not. Okay, he basically opens the door and walks in. But um, when Gilgamesh goes on his catabasis, as he will towards the end of today's class, he's going to talk to Scorpion Man. He's going to be climbing a mountain. He's going to be going through the dark. It's going to be a pretty big deal. Does that help a little bit? Would you say that it's, it's kind of like a, um, not really a life-changing experience, but... Um, Somewhat of that element, would you say that? Somewhat of the... Of that element. Yeah. Oh, yeah, life-changing experience, absolutely. Sometimes, sometimes it's even, you know, a symbolic death, okay? For example, um, in the Roman Christ Catholic Christian tradition and in others, 
supposedly in baptism, you die and are reborn, okay? The act of baptism is a death and rebirth. So absolutely, absolutely. Okay, yeah, go ahead, Lee. I was just um, seeing if I could compare it to a um, point of no return kind of thing. Yeah, oh, absolutely. How long to the point of no return? Exactly. Um, you've paid your money for that CD. You're stuck with it forever and ever and ever. You've bought that car. How many of you have ever bought a car? That's a pretty liminal experience. The first time you walk in with your keys into your car, you know for a fact, one, it's your car. Number two, no matter how wonderful and happy the salesman was to you, everything that happens to the car from now on is on you, your responsibility. You have crossed, yeah, sure, what the heck, point of no return. Okay, other questions. These are good questions. I'll even take mediocre or bad questions. Okay. Well, then to recap, they go on the forest journey. They're really thinking, really happy. They killed him, Baba. They're really thinking they're pretty hot stuff. Ishtar comes on to Gilgamesh. Hey, baby. <laughs> and instead of saying, and this is what I would have said, your goddesshood, you are a very attractive female and a great goddess and a hot babe. Man, you are just so smoking. It's just like makes my eyes just melt just looking at you. That's how hot you are. I'm not man enough to keep your womanliness satisfied, so I will just humbly make offerings to you in the hope that you may let me live. Um, yes, so speaks the female side of the room. But he's Gilgamesh, damn it. And he thinks he's pretty hot stuff. He and Enkidu, after all, have just finished killing Humbaba. So he just makes a list of all the guys that Ishtar has ever had relations with and the horrible things she did to them, calls her all sorts of names, and just literally, utterly disrespects this famous goddess right in front of the town of Uruk, bringing down the bull of heaven. And I'm going to pick it up here with the bowl of heaven. I'm going to resume my brilliant thoughts for today with the bowl of heaven. But before I get into the bowl of heaven, I'll ask you one more time. Any questions? Yes? Have you gotten to public spirits at all? Every word, every gesture, Every picture I draw on the board just oozes public affairs. What do you define as, what do you define it as? Public affairs? Yeah. May I sit down? Truth. No. Um, as defined by the Missouri State University, public affairs is composed of ethical leadership, cultural competence, and civic engagement. Our goal is, as teachers and as a community, is to help our students form themselves along these lines. Okay? And so, in between all of the off-color jokes and bad imitations and stupid drawings, and not to mention boring, repetitive Sumerian epic poetry, I toss in a few side references to the public affairs mission in the hope that somebody who's important and has money and can do things, you know, will see and notice me and you know, make me feel like all important. That last part was intensely cynical. Um, that's for the outtakes, I guess. But in response to it, it's a big question. I'll be happy to answer it off camera. Because ultimately, I do believe in it, but uh, it's pretty hard sometimes. Okay, other questions, other questions. That was an excellent question, and I would give my answer to that about a C plus. I can be hard on myself times, at times, too. Okay. Here comes the action. Um, the ancient Greek word hubris, which we can't expect Gilgamesh to have known, but it's still a good idea, consists of thinking that you are equal to or greater than a god. The punishment for hubris is either death or something that makes you wish you were dead. For example, our, the interim president of this fine university is a guy who prefers to be called Cliff. And that's what I call him. He calls me Joe. Hi, Cliff. Hi, Joe. 
If, on the other hand, I say, whoa, what happened to your hair, dude? He has the same hairstyle as mine. He might laugh, or he might assign me to a job in the student development office. <laughs> you know, running the desk for financial aid. No. <laughs> yeah, and just basking in the love of everybody who comes up to meet the people at financial aid. That would be something that is worse than death, okay? Or, well, I'm not going there. I am just so not going there. It was hubris for Enkidu and Gilgamesh to kill, to kill Humbaba. It was hubris to kill the bull of heaven. Um, it was even more of hubris for Enkidu to cut off the thigh of the bull of heaven and throw it at Ishtar, okay? But hubris has committed, been committed, and somebody is going to pay. The one who's going to pay is Enkidu. If I may, I'd like to pause for a brief digression. I could do it the professorial way. On May 22nd, 2011, an EF-5 tornado hit the city of Joplin, Missouri and virtually leveled it with a death toll of more than 160 innocent souls. If ever you have been through the city of Joplin after it, are, do we have any Joplinians? I live 40 minutes away. My best friends live up in Joplin. Okay, so some of you have seen it. Some of you, no doubt, have worked there, you know, to help out the folks there, which is definitely civic engagement, cultural competence, setting an ethical tone for your fellow citizens and students and stuff. Um, try to imagine, I've not been there, because, frankly, as you now know, I've had enough stuff going in my life the last 12 months as it is. I don't need to drive out to Joplin and feel miserable. Um, although I'm told by one student, you know, Mom, Dad, you still there? Okay, relatives call from the other side of town. Are we still there? Well, yeah, you're still there, but your house and your car are all gone. You know, how would you convey the power, the terror, the human cost, the physical cost, of an EF-5 tornado hitting Joplin, Missouri and just turning it into um, a parking lot and just about nothing flat. How would you convey this without the benefit of writing? How would you convey this without the benefit of photography? Okay, how would you make it possible for people all around this great big nation of ours to know what this tragedy was all about? If all you could do to get the word, pass the word along is to walk around and start talking about it. All the buildings got knocked down and lots of people died. Yeah, exactly. So that when a horrible occurrence like this happens, in a time where people really didn't know how to read and write, or maybe a few did, but not many did, they had to come up with other ways to record the tremendous, unbelievable, fantastic events that they had in their life. And they did this by telling stories in a way that there were memorable details. I see that, Yawn, and your name is still... Damn it. And what shirt are you wearing on there today? What does it say there? Oh! It's a lucky thing that those are the same colors of my alma mater, the University of Iowa or else I would call on you for every question in the class from now on, just to teach you a lesson. Um, a famous example of a legend is the Trojan horse. It's all filled up with Greeks. They roll it up to the wall of the city of Troy, and they yell, Hey, Trojans, um, we're just leaving this huge, big horse here, and we're going back to Greece because we lost the war. And the Trojans, yeah, they should know better. They've only been fighting for like nine and a half years. But 
it's amazing what tendrils, what little bits of hope you will cling to when your life is about to turn into utter hoo-ha. There is a prophet, prophetess by the name of Cassandra. Aww. And I mean, I know people named Cassandra. It's a very nice name, but I'm just thinking, ugh. Um, Cassandra is a priestess that nobody believes. She's always right. Nobody believes her. So when she says, like, well, you know, Hughes, your beard is going to turn all gray and your hair will fall, ah, Sandy, never happen. <laughs> Cassandra says, that horse is just chock full of Greek soldiers that are going to jump out when we're all drunk and partying, every except for me, I'm going to fall asleep crying. And they're going to run out of this horse once you've brought it into town, and they're going to kill all of us, burn the town down, and take me off to be Agamemnon's prize. Ah, Sandy, always with the stories, you wacky girl. They bring the horse in, the Trojans lose the war. I tend to think that what eventually went down in history or legend as a Trojan horse was actually a siege machine that people used to storm cities, jump over city walls, I'm going to erase Humbaba in the cedar forest. I'll draw them in later. You've got people who are this big trying to get over a wall this big. It's very hard to do, especially when there's guys on the thing pouring boiling oil and plain white tease music down on you <laughs> and fire. So what you do is build a big platform on wheels. You cover the front end of it with animal skins and soak the animal skins with water so that whatever they pour on it will not set you on fire. If you're going to have a bunch of guys on the top jump down on the walls from this moving platform on wheels, you'd better have a great big huge counterweight. And so it happened that on May 14th, 1141 B.C., about 7... 30 in the morning, 7.32 in the morning, troops of the first ancient Greek brigade under the heading, uh, under the leadership of Menelaus Papio Daniel. I mean, I can see people just falling asleep even as I say that. Nobody's going to, even, I, I just said it and I don't even remember what I said. It was a great big horse. Great big hollow horse full of guys. And, um... You know, they were stuck in there for a long time. You know, must have smelled pretty good after they've been there for a while. Ha, 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 ha. Tell all the jokes you want, but you'll remember that. The same thing with the Sphinx. The Sphinx was supposedly a creature that lived on the wall of the city of Thebes and Oedipus. That, I know, I know, that dumb mofo Oedipus. Um, I mean, and we, you laugh, but... He knew he was going to grow up and kill his dad and marry his mother. But, you know, in the course of an average lifetime, it's very hard not to kill your dad and marry your mother. <laughs> well, no, stop. It's easy not to marry your mother, but it's tough not to kill your dad. I, I'll, I'll, we, that's a really big digression. The word sphinx is cognate with the ancient Greek word sphincter, which comes from the ancient Greek verb sphingo, which means I choke. Um, the ancient world was ridden with plagues. And the first and most normal thing to assume once a plague strikes is the gods are angry. The so-called Black Plague of the Middle Ages was also called the Bubonic Plague because it resulted in the growth of buboes or boils, which did not burst and send poison through your body or anything like that. Does anybody know how the Bubonic Plague actually killed people? It choked them to death. The esophagus and other, the breathing tubes the, were just so compressed that you literally suffocated 
You died from the black plague by means of suffocation. You choked to death. But who the heck is going to remember, without benefit of pictures or reading or writing, a plague? I mean, and that's even if you know that's why people died. I just know that people are just choking themselves to death. What would you name this plague? The choker. <laughs> and pretty soon the choker, that's what sphinx means. That's what sphincter means. The choker. The same thing goes with the bowl of heaven. The bowl of heaven was very likely a representation of a real plague that fell, a real famine, a real drought that fell upon the people of the city of Uruk. When Anu asks Ishtar, do you have grass for seven years? Do you have grain for seven years? Okay, well then I'll send the bowl. Anu is saying, um, take your, oh dang, he's being ethical leadership again. Keeps coming back. All right, you can go ahead and wreck the city and have a drought and all of that, but make sure that you've stored up food beforehand. I know, that's boring me too. Now for something completely depressing. And I, when they killed the bull of heaven, Gilgamesh and Enkidu are probably at the top of their entire existence. They're at the top of the world. Um, the girls, the cute little temple girls are all saying, Who's the hottest dude in the whole world? It's Gilgamesh! I mean, I've never had that happen to me. Probably be pretty cool if it happened. Um, what I'm going to read to you next is a quote from Enkidu's dream. Please notice that it's not enough that Enkidu is going to die a conscious, lingering death. Painful. Um, emotional pain, physical pain. He's going to get his nose rubbed in his mortality, but good. The gods are doing this to him. The gods are jerks. When the daylight came, Enkidu got up and cried to Gilgamesh, Oh, my brother, such a dream I had last night. Anu, Enlil, Ea, and Heavenly Shamash took counsel together. And Anu said to Enlil, Because they have killed the bull of heaven, and because they have killed Humbaba who guarded the cedar mountain, one of the two must die. Then glorious Shamash answered the hero Enlil, It was by your command they killed the bull of heaven and killed him Baba. And must Enkidu die, although innocent? Enlil flung in rage at glorious Shamash, You dare to say this, you who went about them every day like one of themselves? The gods are arguing. And the gods can argue. At the end of the day, the gods still live forever. The gods are still all powerful, and some human has to suffer. Enkidu is going to be our first instance this semester of the, and I outline this in red because it is literally that important, the sacrificed man. In previous versions of this class, I used to try to be cool and relevant by referring to the sacrificed man as the dead dude. Um, I think it's belittling, really, to Enkidu. I think it's belittling to Gilgamesh's feelings to say something like that. I grew up a lot last year. The sacrificed man doesn't necessarily mean that Enkidu must die so Gilgamesh can live. The sacrificed man is somebody whose death either motivates a catabasis or whose death makes it possible for the hero to go on a catabasis and come back. Enkidu's death makes Gilgamesh start thinking over and over again about his own mortality. And therefore, that makes Enkidu the first in a long line of 
sacrificed men. Sometimes a sacrificed man is female, a sacrificed woman. And again, I don't want to make it sound like they are offered up as a sacrifice. That is sometimes the case, sometimes it's not. It's just that some poor sucker is going to have to die before our hero makes his complete trip to the underworld. Okay, that was really cheerful. Somebody asked me a question that would lead to a more interesting and happy sort of answer, digression, or anything else. Because it's only going to get worse. Go ahead, Bethany and then Sammy. Are we going to be talking any more about the Sphinx, or is that pretty much? That's about all you need to know for the Sphinx for right now. But remember, we're going to be going back to Thebes um, probably in three weeks, four days, 11 hours, six minutes. Sammy. Why did Enkidu throw the leg at Ishtar? What does that symbolize? Well, it symbolizes the, and I got you, Ryan. Um, no, 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 I got your hand. I, I see that your hand is up, and I will call on you as soon as I'm done brilliantly answering Sammy's question. Um, one, the thigh is symbolic of the penis. Okay. But for whatever reason, um, the Sumerians didn't want to, like, you know, say penis in this great epic poem. That's thing number one. Even though Ishtar, being a goddess of love and all of that, a lusty, zesty sort of goddess, has undoubtedly seen penises before and stuff like that. And the other part, I don't know about you, but my life seems to be, in many respects, a whole string of episodes of what in the hell motivated me to do that? It seemed like the thing to do at the time. In other, hand, in other words, immaturity, stupidity, thinking, ha, 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 on you, you female. My buddy Gilgamesh disrespected you, and I just killed your little cow. There really isn't a logical answer, okay? Could it be a symbolic thing since it's above the thigh? It's supposed to be another word for the penis, and that she seems to be uh, quite this... Um... Lusty, zesty. Yeah. She's a goddess. You don't want to cross her. So then he's here to justify his leg? <laughs> yeah, oh, definitely. Oh, definitely. Oh, yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. Disrespectful, yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. All right, let it say for the record that Sammy's answer to her own question was better than mine. <laughs> Good question, brilliantly answered by you. Okay, Ryan, please hit me with your best shot. Um, I was just going to ask, will we need to know about Cassandra for the text? You no, know, as a general rule, I'm pretty good about that sort of stuff. This is just a digression. The stuff on the right-hand side of the board is pretty impressive, okay? It's pretty important. Cassandra is neither here nor there. Taylor. Does that include the Sphinx? Um, the Sphinx will not be on this test. But keep in mind that Antigone, whose tragedy you will be reading later on, and it is public affairs as it all get out, it really is, is the daughter of Oedipus, the guy who solved the Sphinx. So we will be hearing about Oedipus, we will be hearing about the Sphinx again. It's called Adumbration. Any of you ever adumbrated? It's a Roman Latin word for foreshadowing. Other questions, comments, or complaints? Have I answered all of the questions, Thomas? Yes. Um, the way you explain the sacrificed man is that the sacrificed man is one who leads for uh, somebody on catabasis. Uh, not quite whose death motivate, provokes a catabasis or who has to lose his life be so that somebody can go on a catabasis. Uh, my question then is, does the sacrificed man in some way, shape, or form almost become a pseudo-guide to the catabasis? Can. Definitely can. But usually, and this is a good question, and this is a good answer, one of my better ones of the day, um, usually the guide is a specifically different person. And just so the bartender can be a guide too. It's not all completely cut and dried. The person who tries to mess you up can actually wind up helping you whether they know it or not. Good question. Well answered. 
Other questions from this side of the room? Okay, this, yeah, well, okay. <laughs> this is what happens to you after you die. I'm sorry, this is really going to get awful. Um, this is the house whose people sit in darkness. Dust is their food and clay their meat. They are clothed like birds with wings for covering. They see no light. They sit in darkness. I entered the house of dust, and I saw the kings of the earth, their crowns put away forever. Rulers and princes, all those who wore kingly crowns and ruled the world in days of old. They who had stood in the place of gods like Anu and Enlil stood now like servants to fetch baked meats in the house of dust, to carry cooked meat and cold water from the water skin. Life is nasty, brutish, and short. This is what happens to you after you die. To me, this little snippet of Enkidu's dream proves that the ancient Sumerians had what I would call a very depressing Weltanschauung, outlook on life. When your ancient Sumerian kid says to you, Mommy, what is the purpose of life? What happened to Grandpa after he died? He's eating clay in the eternal cold, damp darkness with various famous kings. I should say that in a maternal mommy sort of voice, but you get my point. The world, as it's set up, does not offer you a lot of hope. How does Enkidu react to his impending death? Well, first of all, the, he calls down three curses. Two of them are important. He curses the trapper. That's not the first one he crashed, but damn trapper, may your life go in the crapper. <coughs> The first and foremost thing he curses is the gate to the cedar forest. He talks about how big it is, how beautiful it was. He said, man, you ding gate, you. If I hadn't gone through you, if I had just like chopped you all the bits for being the dang piece of wood that you are, what things would not have happened if um, Enkidu had not gone through the gate. Help me out. Your name is? Yes. Yes. Sierra. Still Sierra. Okay, Sierra. What wouldn't have happened? Okay, Humbaba never would have died. Ishtar never would have come on to Gilgamesh. Okay, the bull of heaven never would have shown up. They wouldn't have killed the bull of heaven. Dang. What a happy life I would have led if only I wouldn't have, A, gone to college, B, married that bum, C, you know, thought it was cool to speed. You know, what the hell was I thinking of when I did that? He curses the gate. And I think getting back to your question earlier in the class, Ryan, that stresses the importance of the liminal experience. He now realizes, now that he's dying, that when he got all nervous in front of the gate and then decided to go on in, he literally had crossed something, and yes, that is a point of no return. Because once he crossed through the gate, they did kill Humbaba. They did, you know, get a big, huge head about themselves. Gilgamesh did disrespect Ishtar. Um, Enkidu did throw the thigh of the bull of heaven, and here he is about to die. The nastiest, yes, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, um, mm -hmm. when we were talking about Enkidu going through the gate, could that also be like when Oedipus left his kind of sort of foster parents and ended up creating everything by living? You know, I'm convinced, Devi, that just about any dang time you walk out of a door and go downward, or sometimes it's upward, I mean, I can look at any doorway and see a liminal experience now. How many of you have ever been through customs at an airport into a foreign land where you don't speak the language? And you're starting to think, what is going to happen to me in this place where I don't even speak the language? That, I would say, is a liminal experience. Sure, life is filled with them. I, I, life is just one big catalysis. 
Good question, well answered by me. Other questions? Yeah, Thomas? Um, it's clear that most of the stories that follows Gilgamesh's catabasis. Could we said that the story of Umbaba is in some way in Keto's catabasis in the story? <laughs> yes, exactly. It really is. Keep in mind that the result of a catabasis is that you're supposed to learn something. Enkidu learned nothing. We'll see how Gilgamesh does. Enkidu, before he passes away, calls down a curse on Shamhat. Did I write her name down here? No. Well, I will write her name down here in a combination of green and blue, which stresses her absolute importance. No, I won't because it looks too ugly. Yep. The, she's actually the second. He curses the door. That's important. He curses the trapper. Who cares? He curses Shamhat. That is not good. Does that help? And actually, the door just stresses a liminal experience. The trapper is neither here nor there. The Trapper shows up in a song by Frank Zappa called Don't Eat the Yellow Snow. Years and years and years after the fact, there's a fur trapper. With a lead-filled snowshoe. Exactly, snowshoe. Um, that song, by the way, is also a catabasis. Look, when Enkidu calls down a curse on um, Shamhat, the temple harlot. He's not very nice about it. He says things like, May you not ply your trade with other play-for-pay girls, but in a nasty, stinking, dirty corner full of vomit from drunk people. He's cursing her because she introduced him to life as a human. He's kind of wishing for the good old days when he ran around um, naked, chasing down and eating robins right out of the sky, just like my dog Yongi does. He, you know, given it all to think over again, he just wished he hadn't been introduced to sex and food and drink and nice clothes and fun times. He said, well, I'd be an animal, but I'd be alive. And he's rude about it. Anybody want to tell me what happens when he does this? Anybody want to indicate to me that they've been reading this stuff and paying attention? Eh, we'll see who else, Sammy. I, I bet you you did. But you're the one who answers her own questions anyway. Um, anybody else tell me who doesn't like it when Enkidu starts disrespecting the harlot? Oh, I smell Papacus Quizicus coming up. All right, go ahead, tell us, Sammy. Well, if one of the gods got onto him, mm -hmm. um, because this is, well, if she hadn't introduced you, then you wouldn't have gone through this, this, and this, but you were happy about it, and now you're cursing her, and that's not right, because she introduced you to all the good things that you're happy about. Very good. That's Shamash, the sun god, last seen shouting encouragement to our people. Shamash indeed does say, Sammy, thank you that um, think of all the wonderful things that wouldn't have happened to you. You got to wear nice clothes. You got to drink. You got to drink wine. You got to eat good food. You got to have sex with hot babes, sometimes for seven days in a row. Life ain't so horrible. Janelle, any questions? Okay. Remember, Enlil does not like it when you do that. Ryan? Shamha, I'm sorry, um, Shamash, the sun god, says, wait a minute. Enkidu, you have no right to call down curses on the harlot, Shama, Shamha, they share names, pretty close. Don't be disrespecting the woman. She merely showed you how to raise your human potential, okay? She was the person who made it possible for you to enjoy a lot of good things, and you really enjoyed hanging out with Gilgamesh and killing monsters, and sleeping with babes, and wearing nice clothes, and all of that. You know, it's really kind of stupid of you to be griping now. And Enkidu goes, you're right. 
And so he walks back his curse. And again, what is it? What is it that he says here? On your account, a man, though 12 miles off, will clap his hand to his thigh and his hair will twitch. <laughs> you will be so hot. May you be so hot that a guy who's 12 miles away will just be starting to do the Viagra Falls dance. Well, and again, no, divine, it gets back to, I think it really gets back to this guy is being confronted with his own death. You know, where modern medicine has made it possible for people even with, you know, really dangerous diseases to hold out some hope of surviving, and they do, and it gets better all the time. At first, you don't accept it. Oh, no, 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 it's not happening. Then you accept it, and then you rage. Well, can't yell at the doctors. They're doing their best. Who can you yell at? God. And sometimes you yell at God. It's not recommended. But if you have that much pain and fear and uncertainty in your heart, sometimes you yell at God. I don't recommend it. Yeah, please go ahead. So, Enki Du, he was supposedly the uh, alter ego for um, Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh. And since he died, does his um, soul still go like to the, you know, well, I don't say hell, but... No, you're, you're right not to use the word hell because that's a Judeo-Christian tradition. I like that. But yeah, it's going to go down to that dark and empty place where he's basically you know, sitting around eating clay and drinking mud and just hanging around with all the other dead people forever. If you think it's boring to be a vampire forever, just imagine that. So, yeah, yeah, and part of it is, I think, Gilgamesh thinking, Ryan, that, um, that oh, my God, my buddy Enkidu is going down there, but it's also got a lot of overtones of, that's going to be me too. Good question. Thank you for asking. More questions? Yeah, go ahead, Sierra. Do those two gods have any other, like, relation to each other other than just being gods together? Like, is that God defending the other one for a reason, or is it just because... Oh, good question. Sierra's question is, you know, are the one gods sticking up for each other? Um, remember I was explaining last time about anthropomorphic gods? You don't have to know the word anthropomorphic to get an A in this class. But basically it means that the Sumerian gods, like the ancient Greek gods, like the ancient Roman gods, like the Norse gods, were basically just a bunch of larger-than-life immortal people. We've already seen Enlil and Shamash get into a yelling match. We saw um, Anu and his daughter Ishtar get into a yelling match, just like parents and kids have done from the dawn of time. So the gods are a bunch of jerks. They really are a bunch of jerks. Go ahead. Uh, isn't Anya, Anya the most powerful god? And, yep. And wouldn't you say he's more powerful than Ishtar? Uh, yeah. Don't you think Anya could have stopped Ishtar from doing all this bad stuff? Or? Okay, let me answer a question with a question. This is excellent teaching technique. Um, <laughs> you ever pull something on your parents? You were, you were telling me about your brother and his speeding ticket, right? Yeah. And he folded it up in a card and gave it to your mom, right? Your mom brought him into this world, right? Yeah. She could have taken him out of it, yeah. right? But she didn't. Why was that? I, that's, a, that's a rhetorical question. I once said it while I was delivering my mother's eulogy, okay, nine years ago. On top of everything else, not once did she ever kill any of her three children, although we gave her plenty of really good reasons to, okay? They're behaving like people. The daddy can put his foot on his daughter big time, but eventually she, he gives her what she wants in the hopes that he'll stop, she'll stop screeching at him. Yes, and your name is still... Courtney. Yeah. Um, do you think that maybe Indicu's death was so horrible and drawn out 
to kind of put that in Gilgamesh's mind? It'd be like, because if you think about it, that's kind of like the God's way of torturing him and sending him out on this way to, you know, find immortality, knowing he won't find it. It's just very true. That's just very, very true. Because, um, I mean, I have been teaching this book for a very long time, longer than most of the people in this room have been alive. And in a sense, doing it this time around is like doing it for the first time. Because you watch the person you love, and it can be anybody that you love. It can be a friend, it can be your grandmother, or anything like that. I mean, you can read it in a book. But when it happens in front of you, oh yeah, that brings it home. I mean, my heart sometimes wants to explode for Gilgamesh. He's still immature and he's going about things the wrong way. You know, I could have told him that, you know, dressing or running around naked like a lion, that's not going to help. And he can run all the way to Utnapishtim if he wants, but Utnapishtim can't help him either. But oh yeah, can I feel for him, Courtney? And you're right. The details, the sad dreams, the details about eating clay and dusty gods and stuff like that. They're meant to scare Enkidu and make him feel terrible, but they also make Gilgamesh feel terrible in a completely different way. Thanks for asking. Other questions? Geez, this is just getting worse and worse by the minute. Well, then Gilgamesh dies. For seven days, and Gilgamesh mourns the death of Enkidu, um, refusing to accept it. And although it does not say so at this point, he refuses in some versions of the story to believe that Enkidu is truly and clearly dead until he sees a maggot drop out of Enkidu's nose. Once he sees the maggot drop out of Enkidu's nose, he know, he's aware that um, Enkidu is good and truly dead, his best friend, his companion, the guy he had all these wild adventures. Remember that fight we had with each other? Man, that was just hilarious. Um, he can't admit it to himself, so he just starts behaving like a total throwback. Not only does he behave like some hick from the country, he takes off all of his clothes and runs around naked, trying to be like Enkidu. But that doesn't help him either. The only thing that he thinks of that can perhaps help him, even though he knows in his heart of hearts it can't, the only thing that he thinks can help him is a trip to visit the famous, I'm going to erase this sphinx. This guy is a char character that you need to know, wouldn't have pished him. It may be that they appear, that they, it appears on the tests as the Utna Pishtims, because this story, like so few stories that come down to us from antiquity, has multiple strong female characters. Ishtar, for better or worse, is a real character. Okay? Stereotypical teenage, stereotypical teenage girl slash floozy, whatever. She plays it well. Um, Shamhat, who is the quote unquote harlot, the play for play girl, pay for play girl, civilizes him, civilizes Enkidu. She's important. Before we go, we're not going to leave until we have met Siduri, the bartender slash guide at the edge of the world. But even Mrs. Utnapishtim is herself an important character. We don't get to see much of her because she's a girl, but she's important too. They'll show up as the Utnapishtims. To give a little bit of the story away, the Utnapishtims sur um, survived a big, huge flood that Enlil sent. 
Enlil sent this humongous flood. Again, I'm giving this away. Because the humans were making too much noise and they were annoying him. I myself woke up about 6.24 this morning to the tune of three howling dogs. Howling at some squirrel or some dumb thing that they saw in the front yard. So, of course, they're dogs. They have to howl, which wakes me up. I was really happy about that. Um... Well, anyway, that's just a digression. He's going to, the Upishtims have been selected for being saved for no better reason than the water god Enki likes them. You're all familiar, no doubt, with the biblical account of the flood from Genesis, in which God decides to destroy the human race because he is unhappy, he believes they are sinful. And they have not stuck to their part of the covenant. So he destroys them, all except for Noah, Noah's wife, and their family, because Noah is righteous. This is not how it happens in the Mesopotamian version. Utnapishtim and his wife, Mrs. Utnapishtim, have connections. That's it. Enki says, man, Enlil is going to start flooding this joint out. You might as well build a boat or something. But don't tell anybody. Um, the water god Enki, um, you know, the difference being, again, Ryan, that, and that's a good question, is that Noah leads a lifestyle that is pleasing to God and is, does his wife and kids, so God just decides to save them and lets them, hey, hey, build a boat, Noah. Take some animals, Noah. But Nepishtim is really no better or worse than any other human being, neither is his wife. It's just that they're big buddies with Enki, or Enki happens to like them for some reason. It's completely random. And after they survive, they get to become a god and a goddess. What are you giggling about there, Janelle? It could have been Barney and Betty Rubble. I mean... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like pull any Bubacus and Jethro off the street and just say, you know, so and so, you know, asks questions during my t asks questions during class, and I enjoy answering them because she asks questions that everybody in the class should be interested in the answer to. Yeah, what the heck? Sure. The idea is that because Utnapishtim was once human and has become a deity, because Mrs. Utnapishtim has started out as a woman, and then became a goddess. Gilgamesh wants to talk to them and find out maybe if he could become immortal too. And folks, he knows what the answer is. He knows where it's all going to end up. I mean, if I wanted to be really depressing about it, every christening you attend, every wedding you attend... Is of a baby who's going to die. <laughs> Every wedding is of two people who are get together. One's probably going to die before the other, and the other one's going to be really sad. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, I always wanted to go out like my great-grandfather, Jacob Pulaski, did. August 3rd, 1937. I wasn't there. <laughs> but I heard the story so many times, I feel like I was. Sitting out on his front porch wearing his metal knee brace from the old sawmill accident, watching a storm come in, boom! A lightning bolt travels, the, hits a tree, travels the length of this wire, goes down to his knee brace and just blows him to smithereens. Age um, 78. 78. 78. He was born at sea, coming over from Poland, and he died an explosion of lightning. Um, four days after that, four days after that, my great-grandmother, okay, Franciska Poluska, um, age, I think, 64, died. 
she was pretty worn out from having been, you know, a farm wife all of these years. You know, she was in poor health. She was in fading health. Jake was as healthy as a horse. He might have lived to have been a hundred. It is my wish for each and every person in the room that number one, you get to settle down and have a wonderful relationship. The person you love most in the world and does the best job of making you happy and that you do many happy things together. And then at like age 91 or something like that, this giant foot comes out of the sky and smushes you. And you don't feel anything. You just get to look in your loved one's eyes and realize you'll be together. That's what I wish on each of you because the rest of it sucks. Gilgamesh knows he's not going to get good news, but he still has to go on this catabasis. That's like life too. <laughs> Tell me about it. Tell me about it. Let's give her a hand. That is. That is just it. Life is a series of catabases. Learn that. And now the next step is to study the catabases of these people to improve the life, to give you more control and more understanding over the life you lead. This will never, ever, ever make you rich. Huh? No, it won't. Well, no, you won't be rich. Nobody will buy it. Um, and if you, if you do get a decent living, what you'll do is get addicted to buying new cars. <laughs> Seriously, what Gilgamesh, and it would have been so much easier if he would have had like a 2012 Volkswagen Tiguan. Yeah, with a kick ass stereo system. And he could just like drive up to Mount Mashu and have his liminal experience and go, yo, Scorpion Man. And the Scorpion Man, who is the leader of the Scorpion Man, go, Gilgi, I'm off to, and they, they give signs, I'm old. The only sign I know is an extremely rude one that begins with an S and ends with an R. Um, so instead, Gilgamesh has to walk mile after repetitive, weary mile up to Mount Mashu, which is on the study guide, which is where the rising and setting sun hang out. I don't know. I just don't know. What is your name? Holly. Holly? I, I just don't know, Holly. You were giving me a look as if to say, how can it be both the home of the rising and setting sun? I don't know. I know that the house of the rising sun is in New Orleans, but I've already talked to you people about New Orleans. <laughs> And <laughs> when there is a place in New Orleans, I just keep walking in the rain. Um, he talks to the scorpion man at the liminal experience, the point of no return, the place that once he's gotten there, he can't turn around. He's officially on catabasis. The scorpion man says no human being has ever walked into Mount Mashu and lived. And Gilgamesh says, I got to go. Scorpion Man says, move on, Gilgamesh. You're not going to like it, but go ahead. You're not going to hear anything worthwhile from Utna Pishtim. You'd be smarter just to go back home. And Gilgamesh knows it, but he keeps going on. And this is one of my favorite repetitions. Weren't you the one who was complaining about the repetitions, Alicia? Elena. Uh, Elena. Okay, Elena. Just like, it's like playing ghosty. One o'clock, the ghost is here. Two o'clock, the ghost is here. Three o'clock, the ghost is here. The 99 bottles of beer on the wall. He traveled four leagues. It was really dark and hot. He traveled five leagues. It was really dark and hot. He traveled six leagues. But Mesopotamians were nuts about stuff like that. He comes up, and here's the point at which we're going to leave it. Um, he comes out, he emerges from Mount Mashu into the Garden of the gods, a beautiful, sunshiny place with trees and flowers and chirping birds. And he meets the bartender at the edge of the world, whose name is Siduri. Look at those big, huge block letters in which I kind of wrote the name Siduri. Folks, she is that important. Because I, if I were you, I would study up on what Siduri tells Gilgamesh. Because it is, to my mind, the most powerful statement 
of the Roman phrase carpe diem you will ever encounter. And although everybody in this room, including Rich, is really too young to understand how little carpe diem means in the hour of your bereavement, it's always been the best civilization has to offer. Now please go out and have fun this weekend. Don't catch any STDs, get busted for speeding, um, wear maroon tomorrow, um, honor the public affairs mission, find your passionate place in the sun, or whatever the heck it is, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>